Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Terry Snellgrove, and I work as a producer at the BC and Yukon studio of the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, we make documentary films and uh, animation. Um, and I am today going to be talking to Janet Perlman. Uh, this is part of the Spark Animation Festival 2021. And this conversation is part of the independent auteurs track. Um, so I want to start with an introduction. Janet Perlman is an animator and an author illustrator of children's books. Her films include Monsieur Pug, Invasion of the Space Lobsters, Lady Fishbourne's Complete Guide to Better Table Manners, Why Me, Sorry Film Not Ready, My Favorite Things That I Love, and Bully Dance, which was part of the animated series Showpiece, dealing with conflict resolution and still used in classrooms today. That was an NFB project. Janet's films have received over 60 awards, including an Oscar nomination for The Tender Tale of Cinderella Penguin and a Genie Award for Dinner for Two. She's also directed segments for Sesame Street. Janet has worked extensively with the NFB and also went on to form her own company, Hula Scope, and she's worked for animation studios around the globe. She's taught at Harvard, the Rhode Island School of Design and Concordia, and has given workshops around the world and still maintains a parallel career as the author illustrator of children's books. And it is my absolute pleasure to speak with her today about her life and career. Janet, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It is an honor to meet you here. Well, thank you, Terry. It's really nice to be here. And I thought that today we could start at the beginning of, of your career, uh, not to approach this in a sort of mundane, linear way. But as I understand it, you didn't actually set out to become an animator. So how did that happen? Um, it was just by accident, I guess. Um, I, I did uh, like to draw and I wanted to be an artist. I knew that in high school. And I went to art school uh, in Montreal, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. And um, that year they brought in animation into their curriculum. And uh, they decided to try out making it a compulsory course for all first year students. So um, I had to take animation and uh, I really did not, I didn't understand it. I don't know what was wrong with me. Um, I, I draw, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't understand uh, different assignments. I do now, but then I didn't quite understand the concepts and uh, there were, it was a very, um, experiment was very, very important in, in that school. Conceptual art at the time was very big. And so there were kind of quirky animation assignments that I actually didn't understand how it was going to all come together. But we also all had to come up with an idea for uh, a film. We were each going to make our own film uh, completely. And uh, so I had no idea what I was going to do, but I finally did get an idea that I liked and it just popped right into my head. And um, uh, when I proposed it, or we all went through each other's uh, ideas, Ideas. we each had to come with a storyboard and I got such praise for this much to my surprise because I really I was a student you know I was almost a deadbeat student I just didn't get it uh, and didn't want to be there and I just got such praise for this and it actually bewildered me but I took it and uh, I made this film and it got a prize and I discovered I really did like it and then I kind of thought what's the problem? You can do anything in animation. You can, you know, explore dance and music and sound effects and drawing and storytelling and all of these things, um, or just abstract uh, art. It, it's, uh, so I realized, I, I realized afterwards, I really love to do animation. And um, 
uh, and I've just loved it ever since. So I stuck with animation after that. And I very quickly, I did get uh, a job at the National Film Board for the summer and stayed there for, for nine years. So um, I was going back a ways, but I was very young when I started, I was 18. So, wow. Um, yeah. Wow, that's it's a great story, and uh, I guess it embraces, you know, serendipity and also the old adage, never say never, right? Because you, you don't know, right, until you're in that situation. So I'm sure the world is grateful that you did have to take that course and discovered what would actually become your career. Through, I, through I would that. never have been in animation, never, ever, because I really was... Uh, I had seen two McLaren films when I was 12, and I had a lot of exposure. I didn't realize there was a lot of animation from the NFB on TV, but otherwise I had not seen uh, a lot of animation, really, except for kids stuff, and I really wasn't interested in kids stuff. Now I am, but at the time that was not what I aspired to do. So, yeah, it's great, and, and I'm really curious about... Um, you know, how you came to the NFB, you say, you say you came straight out of school. So how did that happen? And, and what, what did that first job or encounter with the NFB look like? Um, well, uh, I was, well, I was uh, actually in art school, the second year, I was in second year art school, and they brought in some animators from the NFB to teach. And uh, one of them, Ishtu Patel, told me, you should apply, there, every year they, they hired two or three summer students in the English animation uh, studio. So each year they hired two or three and uh, you have your film to show, so you should apply. And uh, he told me I should apply. He wasn't even my teacher actually, but uh, uh, so I did. And um, I think I was a bit late already or something, but they already had their, hires for the summer. Uh, at the time, the head of the studio was Wolf Koenig and, you know, a wonderful, respected documentarian filmmaker, and he was running the animation studio. But he liked uh, my film very much. And uh, after, you know, lots of calls back, uh, I finally, I, he told me that I could come in and they had a new, they, they didn't have the summer students program but they were starting a new series called poets on film where they were going to have animate different canadian poems so i said sure and i ran to the library and read every canadian poem i could find and uh i read everything you know trying to imagine it animated but uh anyways i came in i think i had i'm not sure I don't remember the steps, but anyways, I had to present some ideas and I had presented two illustrated, two poems I chose, one by Earl Burney and one by George Johnson. And um, he liked them both. So he said he'd like to produce them both. So I came in directing a film, films. Wow. And actually it was the first in that group of Canadian poems, poets on film. And uh, they eventually did, I think, at least 16 of them in three different reels, sort of just um, released in three different groups of four each. And um, I ended up, so I arrived at the NFB to start working. And uh, I was working in uh, an area that was like a corridor where everyone walks by. And there were, I was with the other two summer students, Sheldon Cohen and Anna Maria Mikalides. Uh, Anna Maria Mikalides. And we all were actually making films, directing films. They just sat us down and didn't make us ink and paint other people's films or anything. They just, we just started directing films and make a film. And uh, so um, I animated, uh, you know, in this area, which was, it was really a public area to go out of the studio. You had to walk by us, you know? So we were just there, our desks in this area, like, you know, and actually it was fun. I liked it because uh, it wasn't hard to work in a public place sort of, but uh, you got to see everybody and meet people. And so it was very good actually to be there. 
and um, I had a great time uh, with Sheldon and Anna Maria, and um, there was a lot of camaraderie there. And I learned, at the, so I finished my poems really quickly. They were short, a minute each, perhaps a little over. So um, I finished them in a month, and <laughs> which is very fast, apparently. So uh, Wolf actually um, gave me some uh, public service announcements to do. So there was multiculturalism was a thing they needed to, you know, at that time, uh, the animation studio produced a lot of public service announcements and films sponsored by gov other government departments. They were like the spokesman for the Canadian government, among other things, that's just part of what they did. But that was one thing that they did is if a department needed to tell people about the metric system, they might contact the NFE. It's changed now because now it's gone to the private sector. And uh, which is so, uh, but at the time, you know, I was on a train to Ottawa to go to present ideas uh, to the um, sponsors. Actually, those were uh, Don Arioli, who was a wonderful, entertaining writer, actor, funny person, general all around funny person in the studio, wrote these public service announcements and I did two of those and so I stayed and I actually ended up uh, leaving school because I was still working at the NFB and I wasn't going to leave it to go back to school that I figured I was going to school to in order to be there so I just stay there and I was learning a ton too because I was working alongside fantastic amazing animators I was learning con you know I was in a I just had to soak it in practically, you know, there was, uh, there were fantastic people working there and I, I learned so much. Just yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, I, I should say, I should let people know that uh, both of the films that, that Janet just mentioned, uh, one is a, a poem called The Bulge by George Johnson and the other is a poem by Earl Burney. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, from the yeah. Hazel Bow from the Hazel Bow, and they are both available to view on nfb.ca. Um, I had no idea when I watched those compilations that uh, they were uh, student work, like students being encouraged. Well, no, I was the only student doing ah, okay. That. So okay. the others were uh, already, they had about similar experiences. as I too. They're we all really young and hadn't, uh, made a lot of films, but they may not have been in school. Uh, I was actually in school at the same time, but. Right, uh, right, right. But, well, I, I was curious, cause um, you know, as somebody ha who has walked the hallowed halls of the old NFB on Cote de Lies, um, and somebody who has, uh, you know, worked with the NFB for a number of years, you were there, these, these two films were released in uh, 1976 and 1977. So you were really there in the heyday or what is reputed to be the heyday <clears throat> where there were you know, amazing stories and things unfolding uh, in the hallways, et cetera, et cetera. Norman McLaren, Evelyn Lambert were still working there. Um, what was it like to be uh, uh, young and and starting out um, on, in your career and actually be surrounded by these, you know, um, mythological kinds of, of people and creators? Oh, well, um, it turned out that I really seem, and since then I realized, I really seem to like other animators. They are my people. And I didn't feel that way right through school, uh, camp, uh, anything. And I, you know, so, somehow these are my people. So there are a lot of people that I like who are animators. So I liked a, a lot of these people so much, like them all. And um, uh, everyone was very approachable and uh, uh, when, because when we were first students, Anna Maria and Sheldon and I decided we would, we'd heard about the pin screen, that uh, wonderful, I suppose I should say what it is. What is it? Yeah, it's, um, it's a screen made up of tens of thousands of tiny pins um, that when you press on them, you can get different 
uh, lightness and darkness. And anyways, uh, sometimes you see this as a kind of novelty thing with a bunch of pins in a square like this in a plexiglass and you can push it and you can get your handprint. It's that principle, it's basically that. Um, it was a very, very special, um, what do you call it, uh, art uh, medium, uh, a new and uh, wonderful for animation. So we had heard that the pin screen, and there were just a few in the world, was in Norman McLaren's office. And Norman McLaren wasn't just around the corner. He was actually in what we called in those days, the new building. The NFB had a whole other building called the new building and Norman's office was in there. And we hadn't met him either, but we wanted to see it. And they said, you know, they kept on saying, you know, it's like we're really children. Go, go, go on, go, go ask him. So we said, okay, you know, so we kind of, you know, walk over, we're gonna go now and ask Norman McLaren if we can see the pin screen and we can, meet Norman McLaren at that time. So we went all the way over, we get to his door, says Norman McLaren, and none of us want to knock. <laughs> so, so we were too afraid. We just thought maybe we should just go then. <laughs> and then finally we knocked, he opened the door and we said, can we see the pin screen? And he said yes, and he was very generous and very welcoming. And we went in there and he showed it to us and it was there and it was Norman McLaren showing us the pin screen and there's stuff all around in his office. And gosh, it was really nice, but uh, you know, it was, it, otherwise I felt almost everyone else approachable. It was just that uh, Norman McLaren was such a legend. We really, um, it was beyond, you know, beyond our, uh, but uh, it was great to work alongside all those people because first of all, people were working in all different kinds of mediums. You know, there was Ishu Patel working with beads in one, one room and there was John Weldon who I ended up sharing an office with for like nine years. I shared an office with John Weldon who was funny, funny, funny and, um, and brilliant. Uh, doing wonderful drawn animation, special delivery. And uh, there were you know, people working under the camera and people working on, they also were doing a number of awfully commercial style. Um, uh, there was a public service, an, a, a 10 minute film being produced. And it was being produced like it was in a Hollywood studio with like rows of ink and painters and people like, you know, real production. Uh, to do it quickly and um, uh, kind of very traditional style, you know, and, uh, you know, just people trying out all different kinds of mediums and someone else around who was really fantastic at camera moves and, the, and uh, calculating certain kinds of camera movements and things. And uh, yeah, really the, uh, it was just, there was a room just full of fabulous art supplies, rejects from other people, like weird papers that you could try out. And uh, it was just, uh, it was so inspiring. You know, you could just soak it in. And uh, because at any given moment, there would be maybe someone discussing, um, uh, let's say what's the best way, what, what's the best way to do a certain shot and uh, someone else's, uh, the, their camera, their camera that they had reserved is coming up and their scenes aren't ready. We would help <laughs> to finish the scene or get it ready. And sometimes that would happen, you know, wow. um, uh, <clears throat> you just say, oh gosh, it's just, it's gotta get, I, I don't know, remember, I don't, it's not like that anymore. Production isn't the same anymore, but at the time you reserve camera time, then when it comes, you have to, and you always do it before the scene's quite ready and then it's not ready and you have a deadline and uh, for whatever, you know, uh, reason there's a deadline. And, and uh, so we, we had a certain kind of urgency. Meanwhile, someone else is cutting their soundtrack and coming out of, yes, and the, the, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that in that first summer working in that area, it was right beside the editing room. So we could hear the soundtracks of all these other films and uh, uh, Caroline Leaf was editing The Street, The Sound. So I think we heard 
who are we to judge? I don't remember that line in the film, but anyways, it's, I think I heard boyo, boyo, boyo thousands of times. So, wow. <laughs> while I'm drawing my poem mm. on film, you know, I'm hearing yeah. the street and issues over there and John is yucking it up down the hall. And it's just, uh, it, it was, uh, so it was very social and very lively and inspiring. It's fantastic. And, you know, I, um, even, even though uh, the NFB has changed over the years, I do know that, uh, you know, the animation area in walking through those hallways, I feel like those ghosts and that energy is still there, you know, as you look at all of the maquettes of uh, uh, sets from from stop motion projects, etc. And the photographs. Um, yeah, I can imagine. And it, it must have been such a privilege uh, and so exciting to be 18 or 19 years old and working in, in that area. Um, you mentioned uh, Norman McLaren and uh, I, I recalled um, a series of, of drawings that you did for the NFB blog, which I think are all still available online. Um, and essentially, when the NFB uh, announced that it was going to move, you started a series called Tales from the NFB Cafeteria which was quite delightful. But one of my favorites was the panel, which is my lunch with Norman McLaren or my lunch with Norman. I'm wondering if you could describe that for anybody who's listening. <laughs> well, well, uh, every day, I, w another thing was there was a certain kind of camaraderie in the studio and that we had uh, breaks together. Uh, for me, one of the breaks was my breakfast. Uh, we all had it on the same table every day. And um, we had lunch together. And so whoever was around sat down at the table and often Norman would sit down along with many other wonderful people, including the uh, entertaining Grant Monroe, who was always equipped with a great story to make us laugh. And uh, so we all ate together every single day. It was a, I mean, that still happens at the NFB. Uh, Pre-COVID, post-COVID shall happen again, I hope. And uh, not exactly like that, though. And so one day, Norman was sitting at the table, uh, maybe diagonally from me over here. And um, everybody finished their one left and slowly but show up oh, gotta go gotta go gotta go and nobody's left there but me and norman and I, oh my goodness i've got to this is amazing okay well what could i speak to norman about and he's just <laughs> what could i ask him i here's a moment where i can actually ask him something and learn more about art but unfortunately I realized it was a, an important opportunity, but also I was a terrible conversationalist and I couldn't think of anything to ask. Uh, and so I asked how his, um, how was the macaroni and cheese? And he said, fine. <laughs> and that's Jen, it. <laughs> All I Jen had to Perlman, say. <laughs> lunch with Norman McLaren. I, I, it's such a great story. But it does say how the, he was part of the mundane, everyday living, like everyone else. You know, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you know, some would come in and say Norman's night blooming Sirius, with blooms, which blooms at night one night every 13 years is going to bloom tomorrow night. And <laughs> this is a fact. <laughs> Maybe it was, anyway, so it's just, um, the conversation was interesting and it didn't always have to do with filmmaking. Right. So, <laughs> mostly right. not actually. Yeah. It, I mean, it's great because I th think it's all of those kinds of conversations, not necessarily about the craft, that end up informing the craft, the storytelling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you, um, so in, in, I think it was 1976, you made um, uh, an animated film called Lady Fishbourne's Complete Guide to Better Table Manners, which is delightful. Um, for me, it was a real 
a tongue in cheek look at etiquette. And I, I felt like you were taking the piss out of sort of a classist idea. Um, so what inspired that film? Was that inspired in part by the tales from the NFB cafeteria? Um, you mean, uh, no, the cafeteria, actually, oh, yeah, no? that's true. I, I, there's a connection, but no, um, at the time I just, it was one of, uh, one of my ideas from art school that was sitting around because there was an, et an old etiquette book, a 1920s etiquette book hanging around uh, my house, uh, my parents' house. Uh, and so, you know, I, I found it pretty funny, especially when it always assumed that you had these servants to solve all of these pro problems, you know. And uh, yeah, so I just found it funny. And um, it, I just uh, thought if you had goofy characters, doing all these things or doing everything wrong while the soundtrack was busy telling you all the supposedly right things to do in every situation that it would be funny. And uh, yeah, I remember that I had, um, after the public service announcements, I, I was invited to propose a film and I had proposed a cowboy movie. I don't know, you know, I'm, I didn't really know what I was doing started drawing up this cowboy movie and I did lots and lots of elaborate drawings, but just wasn't funny. I wasn't inter I don't know, it wasn't any good really. And so I said, well, I have that table manners idea. Maybe I'll just propose that. So after, you know, showing the first storyboard of the cowboy movie and, and Wolf said, yeah, well, maybe if you did this, or maybe if you did that, I don't know, it's not quite there, but maybe if you blah, 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 I went off and drew up the table manners film. <laughs> thought, well, I'll just show him this then, because uh, it wasn't working. And this, and he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he said, I don't even know why this is so funny. It doesn't, <laughs> he didn't, <laughs> but he liked it. And uh, in those days, you could propose a cowboy film and then end up with a, a table manners film. Uh, the, the NFB has gotten a little more rigid about things. You propose a cowboy film, you gotta give them a cowboy film or you don't, but you have to cancel one film in order to start the next film and then get that approved. But in those days we just switched it and it just, yeah. it, went, it went for programming just like uh, everything did, there was a program committee and they passed it and I made that film, so. Yeah, well, it's, it's such a great film. And I have to say, there's something really captivating about watching animation from, from years gone by, you know, the simplicity of lines on a page and the distinct look of film and, and sometimes the very specific sound of, of dialogue and music on an optical track. So how would you describe the style of your early work, if, if you were going to sort of put it into words. Mm. How would I just, uh, bleh, um, funny, um, let's say, certain naivety of my first films, because I didn't draw that well, but I kind of worked around it, I think, or uh, so naive, certain naive, uh, naively drawn quirky humor <laughs> yeah no no that's great and i think you know the the your, your drawing style really worked for uh, all of those early films right like i can't imagine and you know uh lady fishborn um drawn in a very very fat kind of uh, style like it, yeah. it really the form and the content really seem to yeah. work hand in hand, which is which is great. Yeah, it would have been just terrible if it had been a 3D animated film. I mean, it just somehow there would, and well animated, it would be even worse. It's just somehow there's this crazy person drawing their version of these table manner rules and <laughs> getting it all wrong. <laughs> somehow seem to work but as soon as you put you know finesse and polish on it it wouldn't be the same yeah no I, I agree I agree I'd like to talk a little bit about um the film that uh you created with Derek Lamb in 1978 Why Me uh which is a timeless film about death 
featuring uh, Nesbitt Spoon, who has just been delivered a death sentence by his doctor. Um, and what, I mean, it still holds up, although obviously we would never see a doctor uh, smoke <laughs> in their office today. That I did though, I did. Was. Yeah, I really yeah, did. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I have no doubt. I, I grew up in Newfoundland and, and I can't, people smoked everywhere. But um, where, did, where did the film come from? From what in the story? Uh, well, this here was uh, Derek Lamb came in 76 to run the animation studio, to be the head of the English animation studio. He had worked in the, the NFB and this, he came back and he had this idea already. Um, he was uh, a writer and director um, and he, um, it was one of the projects that he was uh, developing when he came. So he had the idea of someone, I mean, I'll have to give it away, but it's pretty early in the film, but he, well, a very, someone with a very limited time to live. Um, uh, in fact, his whole life could be shown in the film itself. And um, so uh, uh, Derek had this idea and he had even worked with, uh, it was so interesting how he developed films and ideas. He worked with uh, an, uh, an improv group in San Francisco who just improvised on the idea. Okay, one's the doctor, one's the patient. Now tell them that they're going to, they have a limited time left to live and just go, you know. So he did that. He did some improv sessions with people Then he worked and he actually recorded a soundtrack. He wrote a version of it. Um, he actually, yeah, he, even before he came to the film board, he real he came across that book on death and dying by yeah. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which outlines all the stages that people are supposed to go through when they learn they have a limited time left to live. And so you have disbelief and you have anger and you have uh, denial, uh, anyways, I don't don't have the right order the right bargaining lines, but bargaining think, uh, and acceptance, acceptance at the finally, end yeah yeah so mm -hmm. that was the outline for the film so 10 minute film what he would the character would go through all of these stages so um he wrote a script and he actually recorded it with marshall efron a wonderful actor in the in the u.s and uh richard gilbert um the doc was the doctor and he was an actor in toronto and um, uh, was edited together. And I wasn't even on the scene yet. And he had all of that. So he worked, um, he asked me if I wanted to maybe try and animate this story. And uh, there apparently a lot of people, it gave them the creeps <laughs> in some way. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't want to do a film about someone is going to die, but for some reason it didn't bother me. And um, uh, I put a lot of humor into it and uh, the underlying uh, message and, and subject is serious, but still it's funny. And animation was perfect for an idea for a film about death uh, in that it's somehow a little removed from real life. And uh, anyways, uh, so I did a storyboard and then we, there was some rewriting and then uh, re-recording of the track and then uh, cut the track. Uh, I cut the final track together actually. And, uh, and, then, I, and then I made it, but I, I suppose that for the most part, what you hear and the story is Derek and what you see is me. Right. For the most part. Right, yeah, interesting. And, and I also understand this is the first time that you as an animator had worked with lip sync. Uh, yeah, I did some, a little tiny bit of Lady Fishborn, of Lady Fishborn talking right. at the begin at the beginning and at the end. And then this was, yeah, this is all lip sync, the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it is, it's very funny and it's also quite poignant and, uh, you know, I, I think it still stands up. And again, for anybody listening, you can, you can watch Why Me, uh, at, uh, on nfb.ca. Um, so next up for you was something that was really, I think, uh, quite potentially life-changing, which is in 1981, uh, 
you uh, created the tender tale of Cinderella Penguin, uh, which was a retelling of the classic Cinderella story, uh, but with penguins. And this film was nominated for an Oscar award, which must, must have been, because again, you're still quite young, right? You've, um, so uh, the film deals with bullying and conflict resolution uh, and penguins. And uh, that's a little bit of a consistent theme in, in uh, a lot of your work, actually. When I started laying everything out on the page, I was like, oh, Janet deals with this, this theme a lot. But do you want to talk about the process um, of, of why the Cinderella story and, and why penguins and, uh, and how that came to be for you? Um, well, uh, I was toying with trying to uh, uh, get a new idea for a film. I was just working on that. And um, I've always liked the idea of putting incongruent things together, things that don't go together. Uh, so I was thinking about doing um, Macbeth with um, rabbits and, uh, or something like that. I mean, I, I, I think I was interested in doing animals. Um, I was also working on a, um, a documentary called What the Hell's Going On Up There, which is being done out of the animation studio. And I animated some penguins to illustrate the fact that there are no penguins in Canada. <laughs> so I did a, an elaborate penguin cycle where it just goes, it could just go on and on forever. And I enjoyed that. And somehow um, I thought I would like to animate more penguins and uh, thought, well, I don't wanna use words. I don't know why, um, but somehow I didn't wanna use words, wanted to just, uh, tell a traditional story, but without words. And I had to pick a recognizable story so that people knew what was happening. So Cinderella, everybody knows Cinderella. So orig my original idea was they weren't gonna wear clothes or anything. You wouldn't tell who's who, but you'd still, it would be Cinderella because I insisted on it, <laughs> because I insisted it was Cinderella, <laughs> and, but that people could recognize the story because, uh, because everyone was where they should be. You know, <laughs> but anyways, eventually they ended up in medieval England wearing medieval clothing with medieval music. Um, of course, I don't know. Uh, actually, that was because of the soundtrack, because there was no money at the time. I don't know uh, to do a soundtrack. So no words, but I could use music from the NFB Music Library. So I went to the library and I found an awful lot of medieval music. So slowly but surely, uh, it developed into a film that took place in medieval England, as a lot of fairy tales do, sort of have that medieval dress. And, and uh, so that's how it Yeah, that's great. And I also really appreciated the fact that, uh, you know, we live in this uh, era of Disney kind of defining what uh, female characters look like in films and animated films. Um, and I read somewhere that that you had considered this and said, well, a penguin is is just a penguin, you know? It... Yeah, yeah, well, she was the most beautiful penguin in the land. But um, yeah, at the time, I, the original idea without any clothing or wigs or anything, uh, it worked a bit better maybe. And the idea was that she would be the most beautiful penguin, but they all look the same to us. And so we would never be able to tell. I didn't like the idea that only the beautiful ones were good and the sisters were ugly and they were, and they were evil and mean. And, uh, but um, I ended up plopping a blonde wig on one of the penguins and calling her Cinderella. But still there was, it was hard to say that there was much, you know, that she was any more or less beautiful than the others. And so yeah, yeah. no eyelashes on her. <laughs> yeah, no eyelashes, no, uh, you know, nicely, what is it, the Cupid's bow lips and yeah. all of that sort of thing, which is great. You It'd also be... turn this into um, a book at a later date, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, is there a lot of crossover for you, um, I'm assuming that animation comes first and then uh, books come second in terms of the, the creative trajectory. Is that 
a correct yeah, assumption. Yeah, for me, that's how it's worked out, that uh, I've been able to make uh, two books out of NFB films that I've made. And uh, it, it was quite a different consideration to make the book. I had to redo the drawings and I had to put words to it, which didn't have they didn't have before. But uh, uh, generally, no, I've never done a book that was made into a film. So, uh, but I've been tempted by it because I'm, I've had a film that I've had a lot of trouble getting off the ground. And I feel like if I made a children's book of it and it had some success, then, then it would be easier. But uh, I might not be keen on doing it after because I've already done the book, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's, it's usually people do have books and they make films of them, but I seem to be doing it the other way. Yeah, for two yeah, of so the books. Yeah, so interesting. So um, a few years later, you made a film. This is not an NFB film, but it is available on your website uh, called My Favorite Things That I Love. Um, and the film has been described as an improv session, and I found it hilarious. Um, I love you can start to see uh, in terms of your development as an animator, you're working with drawings, but you're also now bringing there are some objects in there like the Dutch girls with the Q-tips and things like that. Um, and I'm assuming you created it while you were teaching at Harvard. Um, and I was curious to know how deep was the improvisational aspect of the, the making of this film, Janice? Well, um, you know, I guess it wasn't totally improvised, but I mean, I had to improvise in order to come up with this, the idea and the story, but it's just that when I executed it, it I was teaching at, at, at Harvard, and they have an Oxbury animation stand, and I, at the time, uh, uh, equipment to make films was not as accessible as it is now, in fact, everyone can make it, but at the time, I made a film because I had access to an Oxbury animation stand. So I uh, uh, decided I would, uh, it was really without a grant or anything like that um, at the time, um, but I knew that I would have to uh, be called away from doing this film. I had to put it down a lot of times. So um, I designed the film so that it's in sections uh, uh, and they could be, I could finish a section and then put it aside, uh, which is what I did. So it took a few years to do, um, but um, it's based on all of uh, the kitsch and, and junk that I have around my studio, in my office at home. I, uh, I collect uh, horrible objects and, you know, crying clowns and velvet paintings. And, and uh, I just, uh, I, I like the idea of doing a film that nobody wants, you know, like every film I've done, I made a proposal, I've done a storyboard, I did a storyboard and I proposed it and then, you know, it got uh, approved and then this was one that was just for me. I had also spent about 10 years at that point doing, working on other people's films and projects and not on my own. And so I had this hunger to do something and I had a camera. So no excuse anymore not to have another film. I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. So uh, um, I wasn't working at the National Film Board. And uh, so I did those storyboard, the whole thing. And I commissioned a piece of music and all I, I had some friends in Boston who were uh, commercial, uh, commercial music uh, uh, studio or um, service, music service, and uh, I gave them some old uh, uh, Leroy Anderson music that's, you know, that uh, um, in, for inspiration and um, uh, Holiday for Strings, I think is one. And uh, then I showed them a lot of my kitsch collection and um, uh, said I, I'd like it to be in sections. So to start off with um, happy, I gave them a whole bunch of them and I didn't give them an order. Uh, I said, I want happy, I want brave and noble. I would like a, uh, <laughs> it was like an, a work order. Um, <laughs> happy, <laughs> brave and noble, sad, glamorous, anything you want ending in 
uh, a finale and so, <laughs> five minutes, please. And so <laughs> they did, they did do that. And, you know, uh, I knew they were doing well when I, they, I was calling and saying the music coming along. They said, you know, there's a lot going on in that Leroy Anderson music and in this kind of music, and it's not so easy. And I thought, oh, good. Okay. They're getting into it. They're really analyzing it. They're not going to like knock off something for me. They're, and they did, they did this great piece of music and, uh, you know, everything goes in time to the music. And that's why I asked for it first. Everything yeah. dances and moves in time to the music. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah. It's great. I mean, it's such a fun film. I was curious um, because I, I, I did see that you had referred to impro animation uh, before. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, what that is and, and when you've worked with it. Uh, well, the, the next time I really just went off and did what I wanted completely, uh, thinking nobody wants this film here I go and <laughs> um, was uh, sorry film not ready and that one um, well uh, I guess I was in an adventurous mood and I decided to fill in an, a festival entry form the Ottawa Animation Festival which I love and I've been to every single one except for one um, I really had no film to send because I didn't have, I had not made a film to send to the Ottawa Animation Festival. And uh, I thought, took a piece of music that was, happened to be on my desktop uh, called Lamb a Cookin by Lance Neveu based on a stupid song we sung in the car. And <laughs> started animating this. And it just was going nowhere. It was just terrible. So, I mean, this is just a stupid idea. So I've been on a jury before and you don't really want to have confusion. So I went back to the Ottawa animation site and I couldn't to withdraw the entry form so they wouldn't have a problem with it. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't figure it out. So I changed the title of the film to Sorry, Film Not Ready, you know, and left it at that. Anyways, a week late passed and I got an email saying, we still have not received your film, sorry, film not ready, but we've extended the deadline for another week. So then I just thought, well, I have to make this film. And so I found a piece of music, a different piece of music by Judith Gruber Stitzer, where she was just uh, made something out of a lot of machine noises. And it was perfect, you know, because it's very percussive and rhythmic. And I, uh, sat down and I'd say this is where I did improvised animation because I sat down like here now and said okay I'm going to make the film now and I had no idea what I was going to do so you know I start off drawing you know a, a platypus and uh, as long as it goes in time to the music anyways I just kept going I found one of my toys I stuck it under the camera and I just I was animating and I say okay I'm going to move through this here and what's next I don't even know but it was really like that. I really didn't know what I was doing, but I did connect everything, you know, because it was digital also, I could sort of connect to anything. And I, uh, I did the whole thing drawn in the computer for the most part, except for photographing some puppets, um, toys and things. And, um, you know, it was fun because what happened was uh, also that there were some parts that were kind of funny and it was just what I wrote on the screen, which was, film almost over yeah. film will be over soon <laughs> <You know? laughs> well if they're bored you know or here comes the good part I didn't put that in but you know it's stuff like that it was self-referential and you know it, it's not much work to put a little sign message on the screen that doesn't okay killed in another couple of seconds there and you know it was well, it's very funny. I mean, you know, film, I think your credit is film not finished by Janet Perlman. Music yeah. not finished by Judith Gruber Stitzer. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's hilarious to watch. And also, I mean, we're going to skip around a bit because I am going to go back to the past in, in a minute. But um, you've also talked about you know, you, you started uh, working very traditionally in animation with film, you know, with uh, uh, drawings, lines on paper, et cetera, et cetera. And then as computer animation became 
a little bit more ubiquitous. You've talked a lot about that because that being a very liberating thing for you as an artist. Could you get, talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, well, actually, um, I was interested in computers since very early. In fact, uh, uh, John Weldon, who I shared an office with, he gave me, uh, uh, he, he was uh, a whiz a com at um, computer things, brilliant. And he gave me basic programming lessons in basic, but I actually wrote some programs to help my animation, very rudimentary. But my brother gave me, who was also in computers, gave me um, a home computer in 1980. So I had a computer in 1980, it was a Commodore 64. And uh, so I, I used it from then on, and you know, I, then I hopped onto the Apple bandwagon uh, when that came around. And um, I used it a lot, but I only did yucky graphics on both of those things. I tried to do them, but I couldn't do anything that I could really use. Uh, and uh, I wasn't persist, I didn't really persist at it either. I was happy with using it for games and for word processing and uh, that's it. And uh, I slowly uh, got into it maybe in the late eighties, I guess. Then um, when I got an Amiga and um, there, the Amiga really was ahead of all the other uh, computers at the time, in, you know, in terms of its graphic capabilities. And it, you know, it's um, in fact, one of the programs that was made for the Amiga, uh, those people went along and ended up uh, developing it into TV Paint, which is a program I use wow. now. And uh, I mean, it's been through different owners, I think, and different, you know, but they're, you know, when I looked at the, when I first got TV Paint and I looked at the manual, I asked, I had to write to them for something and I asked them, are you a bunch of old Amiga guys or what? And they said, you guessed it, you know, <laughs> Deluxe Paint 2 um, is what they had worked on. So anyways, it was interesting, but gee, what were we talking about? Computers, yes. Yeah, we were, we were right. talking about how it was a, a liberating yeah. or could be perceived as a liberating thing for you. Yeah. Well, animal. I think it took me another 10 years before I really used it for a film. I, I did backgrounds, I learned Photoshop, and I did some backgrounds for Bully Dance. But I still drew it. It was colored in digitally, but not by me. And it was just a mystery what they were doing um, to color it in. But I did the backgrounds with it. And um, then I, you know, I, I slowly shifted over and got more knowledgeable. Um, you know, I worked on, when I worked on Bob and Margaret, David and Allison had the Amiga, which introduced me to a fantastic animation testing system. And so that's how I ended up with the Amiga. And then um, uh, somehow, I, you know, when did I jump into, I don't even know the first time, but I ended up with Toon Boom um, right. for a long time. And uh, uh, start. it's when I, you know, it's when I got a Cintiq. Actually, I wasn't really drawing so much in the edit. I would do corrections, but not full drawings until I got a Cintiq, which is uh, like a Wacom tablet, except it's also a screen and you can draw right, your drawing is right where you're drawing. And so, so yeah. it made a big difference. And with that control, I was, a, I, I was happy to do animation just with, with that. And uh, so I've stuck with it ever since. And um, yeah, without that, that undo button, um, uh, it just made a huge difference. And I can just work more quickly or else actually more thoroughly because I can redo things very easily. And uh, I don't think I do films any faster. It's just that uh, they, there's more that I can do. Right, right, that makes sense. You mentioned uh, Bully Dance, which, which is actually uh, one of uh, my favorite films of yours. Uh, and Bully Dance was made uh, with the NFB. Um, it, it, again, it's a piece that deals with conflict, part of the showpiece series, which dealt with conflict resolution. And um, Bully Dance to me um, 
it, it is truly a hybrid film in, in many respects because it's at once a dance uh, uh, set to a nuanced and captivating soundtrack. And at the same time, it's also, to me, a formal exploration of lines and patterns and all of this coming together to explore the theme of bullying without using words, which I think is, is um, frequently a, a fantastic thing in, in animated films. Um, and the film starts as quite a playful romp and then twists and turns. Um, again, anybody can, can see it online. Um, so I was curious, what came first with this film? Was it the images or the music or were they created in tandem? Um, in terms of the production itself, uh, the music came first. Uh, actually, I asked Judith Gruber Stitzer, I'd like to tell the whole story with a percussion soundtrack, all percussion. And uh, I think it's just partly because I was just interested in having a percussion in uh, soundtrack and because I was interested in dance and uh, I wanted to have dance so it just happened to be things I wanted to do at the time and uh, so first I did a rough storyboard and I did a storyboard so I had the story so I could show to Judith what I had in mind what was going to happen and uh, she didn't have time to just do the whole soundtrack right then but she had time to at least feed me as I went along in sections, pieces of percussion that I could animate to, that she would stick to for the final sound. So I had kind of a temp track uh, as we went along. We decided on a few things like that the tempo would increase in speed. The tempo would increase uh, slightly as we went along from scene to scene um, and uh, roughly how long each scene was. Uh, so for that, I took the storyboard and I put it in a timeline on screen to see how it played out and sort of had a rough. So she had imagery to work with for the percussion. She gave me back percussion. And in the end, I animated to the soundtrack and then she hired real musicians to do the sound, final soundtrack with the same tempo. It's, it's great because the drawing, uh, the drawing style inherently has this sort of percussive percussive quality, you know, with all of the lines and the patterns. And so it, it's so beautifully integrated. Uh, I just, I think it's, it's such a, a strong film. Um, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about collaboration to you. I mean, obviously, in animation, it is uh, a collaborative form, uh, but but sometimes working as an animator also means working in, in isolation. Um, but there's something that uh, is consistent throughout your history. You know, you've collaborated with filmmakers Anne-Marie Fleming on an animated sequence for Window Horses. You collaborated with Jeff Chiva Stearns on Yellow Sticky Notes. You worked with David Fine and Alison Snowden on Animal Behavior. And of course, you enjoyed a long-term collaboration with uh, Derek uh, Lamb and also composer, composer Judith Gruber Stitzer. So let's talk about the importance of collaboration in animation. What does it, what does it give you that working as a sole animator doesn't? Well, you, you first of all, uh, it, in many of those instances, it's really was started by them and then they came to me. And there is certainly some collaboration, but it's more or less depending. Like uh, on Window <laughs> Horses, uh, I think I had free reign, but within the confines of the, of the project, of course. And, and uh, Anne-Marie had to feel that it was right. She wasn't going to, she didn't have to take anything I proposed to her because I proposed it to her. So it's not a complete collaboration. I think it's more, was more her film and I would never be drawing stick girl normally. So, you know, <laughs> so, but I try to bring what I can to it. So it's a collaboration that way. And, um, and uh, so I had a, a good amount of freedom and if it wasn't quite right then I'd make changes too but it was but in the most of those cases I was actually you know working for them but it was uh, um, 
but hopefully bringing what I can to it. And uh, in the case of Alison Snowden and David Fine's uh, with Bob's birthday or with uh, animal behavior, um, they really had their storyboards. So I'm just bringing something to the animation, hopefully. And um, they, uh, what I did for them, they, they either used it, but sometimes they changed it and sometimes they even replaced it or they, it's just the way it was. So it's, you know, it's, uh, but it's up to them. They have to do what's work, going to work for the, for their film and it's, but it's their film, you know? So it's still collaboration and, um, you know, uh, um, but uh, I think still someone takes the lead. So um, I do find it's really, uh, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy doing these. Things. I've worked on other films where I worked in totally different styles, which I thought I couldn't do at the beginning, like Edward Gorey's style or, um, you know, and you end up learning things and discovering things that you wouldn't have known otherwise. And you bring that to your, to your future projects, um, what you've learned or how you, how other people think, uh, you can, you learn so much from that. And also I just, I love to draw. And so if it involves drawing and animating, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think the, the obvious thing about collaboration is that, you know, when you're, you're uh, talking about ideas with someone else, you're not just sort of rattling around in your own headspace, right? Yeah. You're actually through through dialogue and discourse. There's a real opportunity there for ideas to grow and evolve, and uh, you know, good collaborations, uh, communicative collaborations, mm -hmm. I think, are are just make good sense, right? Yeah. yeah. I think why me though was a true collaboration because yeah. really we didn't do what each other does. Uh, you know, we, I did the animation and the drawing and um, he did the writing and uh, directing of the, uh, the acting, working with the actors and developing the idea. So um, uh, we did different things and it was a real uh, collaboration, you know, two pieces made the whole. Um, right. And uh, you know, in other cases, you know, with uh, Judith and the music, well, we do different things, but music is very, the soundtrack is very important. In fact, I often need it first before I do the animation, just in order to inspire me and, uh, um, you know, end up with a, a better film. Um, it needs to be done that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, another film that was made the same year that you made Sorry Film Not Ready, which I still, I just, I love the story. I love the making of that, that film. I love everything about it. So you made a little film that's on your website called Egg, which uh -huh. is so cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> it's an animation of a hard boiled egg without feet, without eyes, without a face, in which literally almost nothing happens except one uh, uh, on-screen action pose in which the egg sits at an angle. Uh, there are a couple of close-ups uh, uh, and a series of descriptive texts on screen that explain a variety of non-expressions. Uh, set to an upbeat tune, we see the egg in various emotional states. Um, and it's short and it's funny, funny, funny. What was the springboard for creating it? It's so funny. I'm glad you like that one. Um, that, uh, you know, we, we had uh, produced a, um, the company that I had with Judith Gruber Stitzer. We produced um, uh, a half hour for Cartoon Network called Penguins Behind Bars, which was based, oh, that was a film based on a book. Uh, uh, I did a book of Penguins Behind Bars and then it became a half hour special. And um, we were sort of, we also did some, some pilot uh, films to network. Anyways, we were getting involved in television production. And uh, I also had some ideas. We had, there were some series ideas that we decided to propose. We went to Annecy, we went to 
uh, the, the, the film market, we met people, we looked for agents, we tried, we got representation, we did all these things and developed and learned all about that whole field. And the, you know, we and thousands of other people with their film properties. And I just got uh, struck by the film property and how, you know, okay, so here it is, you know, Budgie, the budge bird, Budgie bird. And he's very educational and he knows everything and he's this and he's that. So I had decided that it would be fun to have um, also really economical to have a character that barely moves and who saves the day all the time. And so um, this egg uh, is a superhero and it's called egg. And people would say, look up in the sky, it's egg. And then you'd show an egg, you know, in the sky. And uh, the idea was that super, super villains would like bounce off the egg and get injured and paralyzed or whatever. If egg didn't do anything as far as you could tell, but the egg always saves the day. And so that was, uh, you know, I don't think I ever proposed it to anyone, but um, I'm not even sure where to propose that. That was also the thing was that, you know, you had to have, uh, think about the uh, property that you're proposing and what age group it's for and uh, what would be a good slot for it. And um, I thought egg would be good for everyone, but anyway, so I, that's where egg came from. Oh my God, it's, so funny. So very it's funny. A, it's, a, it's a valuable animation property. Yes, yes it is. And hilarious to boot. Um, I want to talk about Monsieur Pug, which was created with the National Film Board, I believe with the French Animation Studio. Um, and Monsieur Pug is a delirious fable about a particular brand of modern madness that brought on by the omnipresence of smartphones in our lives. Um, I love this film. Um, I love the voice work in the film. Uh, Monsieur Pug's neurosis completely spoke to me. Um, and I, what I wanted to talk about is now we see you using more and more real elements in the film. Uh, we, there are human eyes, there's real origami, there's live action in li live action video footage. Um, so I, wa I wanted to talk about how, how it was that you wanted to integrate more of these like actual objects, because I feel like you would, while you had been doing it, you were now doing it in a, in a more kind of committed way, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, well, I guess um, learning more, getting more uh, comfortable with uh, computer software, animation software, I found that a lot of things that seemed to be beyond reach were actually quite easy to do. And uh, so um, I've always been fond of photographs mixed with cartoon somehow. And the idea, the first idea of Monsieur Pug was simply a, a man trapped in a cartoon body. And um, in the, uh, that it was an animated cartoon with a live action person stuck inside it. But uh, it was hard to make that work and as it developed and it ended up being a man, a cartoon of a man stuck in a pug body. And, um, uh, you know, it just, uh, I incorporated photographic images into the backgrounds and, uh, you know, here and there. And it was just fun to do. I can't say there's anything uh, meaningful about it, except that uh, I like the looks of it and the mixture of the medium. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny, and it's definitely a film that is of of our time, right? It's of this time very much. So I was curious because between Invasion of the Space Lobsters, which you made in two thousand and five, and Monsieur Pug, uh, twenty fourteen, you reference uh, there are all of these paranormal references. A reference to Area fifty one in Monsieur Pug. <laughs> you caught that. I did. <laughs> And I was curious to know if you had an interest in the paranormal, just out of curiosity. Uh, uh, no, I don't really. I don't have an interest in the paranormal. I mean, a long time ago I did, but no, I don't. Um, in fact, maybe uh, 
um, I have an aversion to pseudoscience. <laughs> so so uh, a lot of things I will, you know, I can't say much about Area 51, except I threw it in there because it was fun, you know, because yeah. it, it makes you think of a whole other subplot that could be happening, you know. So it was fun to mention that, you know, the mysterious Area 51, but I can't say I know much about that. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, fun. I, I found myself wondering what would happen if Monsieur Pug were to hang out with Anne-Marie Fleming's dog, an old dog, and some of the critters from David Fine and <laughs> Alison Snowden's animal behavior. And so I, I went down this rabbit hole of ima imagining Monsieur Pug with all of these other <laughs> Uh, NFB animated characters, and it, it was fun. It was fun. Um, I wanted to talk about a residency that you did in 2014 uh, at Les Musées de la Civilisation à Quebec in Quebec City. Pardon my awful French, everyone. Uh, the resulting piece called Je sais ce que j'aime, I know what I like, is a fabulous short film. Uh, for me, it was a reflection a little bit, or the you know, there was a, some sort of homage to 1994's My Favorite Things That I Love. Um, I found it easy to see threads from your early work, um, as well as your contemporary work reflected in this short. But I was really curious to know, uh, because I had read something on the NFB blog when you were preparing for the residency and you were uncertain as to how it was going to go because you were animating in a public space and you were uncertain what would happen when all of these people would start talking to you. And so I, just out of curiosity, how did that go? Oh, it was, it was great. You know, I, they had a wonderful exhibition of uh, animation. Fabulous. It was beautifully, uh, 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 done the uh, this exhibition of animation at the National Film Board. They had uh, it, it was just wonderful. Uh, people could make animation there as well, and they could look at the history and how wonderful objects that were there and beautiful artwork. And there I was, um, one of several animators who spent uh, a time at the museum over that summer or over that year. And uh, each one would have a two week residency and make a film in this space. So I was actually part of an exhibit. So um, I was surrounded by plexiglass and I had just had a computer and a Cintiq and um, I, th I set it up so that the screen, there was another screen facing out so they could see what I was drawing. And then there were kind of, there were holes in this plexiglass so I could like speak to people and answer questions. So. <laughs> I thought it was like a zoo. It was, it was funny. Well, it wasn't a, an, it, it packed all the time, but schools would come in, you know, and for the most part, they look around the exhibit and then they want to make some animation. But most of the questions I got were, for, were from people who wanted to know how to get into animation or how to do it or how, if they want to get started. So most of them were interested in themselves doing it. And uh, um, so, uh, so when people would come by, I felt like it was my obligation to show them what I'm doing. So I'd sort of do a run through and say, here, this is where I am. I'm just animating. I actually got a little piece of music and I was animating to the music and I explained the project. Uh, the project in this case, I had we had to propose projects and I proposed that I photograph things or get images of things that were in that museum and incorporate them into the film. So I took, I got some pictures I was able to take of, some, I got had to get permission to take some pictures of certain exhibits. So I have, uh, you know, articles of clothing from New France and, uh, you know, just old things, old artifacts. And then I also took pictures of the walls and the granite for textures. And then I went into the cafeteria and I took a picture, you know, of a donut and, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, you know, coffee cup and things. And all those things ended up and then Norman McLaren's, a chair that he'd used in the film, A Cherry Tale, was hanging 
and I pixelated that, put that in the film. Uh, so the film doesn't make much sense either, but it, it really was never meant to, you know, it was just meant to be a stream of consciousness thing. And there again, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but it was uh, very little pressure. It was it was okay. Once I start drawing, I actually think, oh, these people just go away. I'm really enjoying animating this. And then, you know, but it really wasn't a problem. I'm also good with being interrupted. So, you know, oh, that's not great. One of those, yeah, yeah, not one of those. Yeah. I don't have to work in a cave. I really don't. And, right. Uh, I guess the training from working in that corridor <laughs> at the National Film Board when I started. Yeah, oh, that's that's a beautiful bringing everything uh, full circle. I do have a couple of sort of short snapper questions. So I would like to close with a, a, a handful of um, fairly uh, straightforward questions, what I'll call the quick snapper round. What is the longest period of time you've spent working on a film? Um. 18 months, but I'm about to break that record, but 18 months, let's say, but uh, it's hard to say, you know, when uh, sometimes the development takes a really long time and I spend a long time developing and then there are gaps in between. So sometimes on the calendar year, it would be even longer, but, you know, uh, um, uh, I do very, very thorough development of certain types of films, not the ones that are improvised, obviously, no development there. But, uh, you know, it, it can be very long, but still, uh, what I'm doing now, I think is going to be the longest. So yeah. that is one of my questions. But but my next question is, what is the shortest period of time you've spent on a film? Well, a week, <laughs> that film, <laughs> I spent, you know, uh, <laughs> It can be, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, a week, but uh, I never do films in a week. And those films are one minute. Uh, I've done a few of those, you know, a week or 10 days. Um, and uh, they're, so they're very short, but they're also, you know, there's a certain kind of uh, uh, depth that I simply, it, they don't have. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Um, Janet, what advice would you give to emerging animators? Uh, well, um, if you're in school, take advantage of that because you, no one is telling you what kind of film to make yet. No one's telling you you've got time because you have to make films. Your film is going to be your film or films are going to be it's going to be your portfolio. And in the end, if you want to work in animation, which is what I'm assuming, um, it's your work that you've done, which is going to speak the most for what for, the most for you and your degree won't make a difference. It's your portfolio. And and keep and if you're not in school. Um, keep drawing. Uh, you can animate, you know, get, uh, get going, just get doing, doing it. Don't, uh, no more talking, just draw. And if you make um, a really stupid stream of consciousness film, well, you don't have to show it to anybody and you can just go on to the next one. <laughs> sage advice, sage advice. Um, and my, my last question is, what are you working on now? Is there, are you at liberty to tell us anything? I can, yeah. I'm working on two films, actually, though not at the same time. I'm mostly working on a film for the National Film Board uh, right now, um, which is uh, based on the song Complaint pour Saint Catherine by Kate and Anna McGarrigal. And it's a much loved song. Um, and I've always loved this song. And it's, uh, it's a five minute film. And it takes place in the um, metro of Montreal. And um, it has lots and lots of characters because <laughs> it's the metro. <laughs> but it's funny. It's very funny. And I hope it, uh, I hope in the end that it's something that makes people laugh and also has a warm feeling about it. But, uh, and uh, 
the other film is uh, sort of a more experimental kind of film, which I have a grant for from the Quebec uh, Council for the Arts. And um, it's basically, a, it's an a, expansion of a film I made called Let's Play Till It's 19, Let's Play Like It's 1949, which was uh, use of uh, old educational footage and my adding some animation to it. And that should be fun. It's a lot of fun to do. Um, and I'll be getting back to that. I, I do bits and pieces here and there, but to really finish it, it'll be a little while because of uh, working on the other film. It's a black and white film too, so. Fantastic. Janet Perlman, it has been such an honor to spend this past hour and change with you. Um, I hope that we get to meet in the real world someday, either at a film festival or at the NFB in Montreal. Uh, but uh, much uh, for this fantastic conversation. Uh, well, thank you for asking me great questions. And thank you for asking me to be here. That's a, really a pleasure. Thank you.